Aquilo. Season 3. Chapter 3. Going Back for Seconds. It turns out, I do know that girl. Petunia, that is. It didn't sit quite well when she introduced herself as one of my customers and I couldn't place her. I pride myself in being able to recognize all my clients. Maybe I can't put a name to all of them, but usually I can place their face and especially each of their specific orders. What people eat at the Aquilo Cafe is important. You see, when someone keeps ordering the same thing week after week, day after day, it's not just a habit. There's a ritual to it. And rituals are magic. Petunia, or Pete as she has to be called, orders Earl Grey tea with honey and, when I have them, a slice of glazed banana bread. Failing that, she'll settle for a croissant, the same that I usually serve to Ian's cloud worshippers. And that's the thing, you see. When Petunia and I met in the woods and we sat under the dancelites talking about alcohol and fruit juice, she was just Pete, a random party-goer. She wore her warm, baggy clothes and her beanie. Her shoulder-length hair was brown now, hanging loose and relaxed. It made me wonder if the pink was a wig, or color that she cleaned out, or my own skewed memory of the evening. Today, she's dressed as I usually see her. White robes bright as daisy petals on a midsummer day. Her hair is braided and tied back behind her head. Even her posture is different. Her back is straight and her chest puffed out, replacing her chill demeanor with strict confidence. She's not a different person, but she might as well be. Oh, hi, Pete, I greet her, a little confused. It's Petunia today. She beams her smile, then curtsies, making sure I notice the unmistakable robe. Fine, then, I answer. You call me Miriam, then. Earl Grey? With honey, please. I prepare the tea, putting it in a small cup with some honey squirted at the bottom. I check the display case, but I'm out of banana bread, so I set aside a croissant in its stead. The counter is already crowded, so I bring the food and drinks over to one of the nearby tables. Fred the DJ is having hot chocolate and a chocolate muffin. He's not dressed up like a cloud worshipper. In fact, I'd be hard-pressed to say if he's wearing anything different from what he did the previous night— from his worn-out combat boots and baggy jeans all the way to his expensive-looking headphones. Here you go, I say, putting down plates and mugs between the two. Didn't know you were, uh... Of the faith, Petunia answers. My parents are the true believers. I'm what you'd call collateral. I nod my understanding. My parents weren't exactly practicing Christians. Both went through the whole baptism and communion thing with their parents, but their ties to the church didn't expand much further. Especially after Eric came out, some people in the congregation suddenly became intolerable through their intolerance. Since my parents always doted on my brother, they couldn't abide homophobia from their peers. So that was that regarding religion in our home. However... I did have friends with parents much more attached to their faith and demanding that their children follow suit. In fact, Petunia continued, lowering her voice to a whisper, it'd be really cool if you didn't mention where you saw me last night. Why would I have seen you anywhere last night? I ask with a wink. It's going to feel weird if I have to lie to Ian. We're not friends, but he's a good customer and has never been anything but gracious and patient. I may not understand his cult or belief system, but I've grown to respect the man. Besides, I hate lying. But I like Petunia, and damn if I don't know exactly how it feels to want to cut loose from what people expect once in a while. So, she says, changing the subject, any idea who this goofball is? Her chin points towards Thomas. He's stepped off his stool at the counter and is now bouncing back and forth over the red and blue lines that divide the Aquilo Cafe. I remember doing something very similar on my first day in town. Since then, I've come to cross those lines dozens of times a day without so much as a second thought. What an idiot, Fred says, pulling off his earphones. Simple pleasures for simple minds. Petunia laughs, and I stretch a forced smile over my mouth, pretending not to be collateral damage to his barb. 
Yeah, I agree. Did I mention I hate lying? Hey, Fred continues. We're doing a rain check on festivities tonight. You gonna make it? Am I gonna make it? This kid isn't just inviting me. He's assuming I'm going to be there. He acts like I should be there. Like I belong. I get that the age difference isn't that big. A couple of years? But I've never associated with these people. I'm an outsider. I haven't been to their schools. I didn't grow up in Aquilo. They're students and I'm a business owner. Stefan should be the one going to these parties, not me. No matter how much I look the part, I'd be an imposter at this event. Sure, I catch myself saying. Awesome, Petunia pipes in. Feel free to bring that snack of a friend. She punctuates her enthusiasm with a sly wink. Snacks and my friend. Got it. I know what she means, and as I walk back to the counter to tend to my other customers, I still glance towards Gulliver. I won't lie. It's difficult to see him like Petunia does. I guess he's not that much older than I am, and while he's objectively good-looking, tall and muscular, there's something about him that intimidates me to this day. Maybe it's how he doesn't fit any of the patterns of local Aquilo residents, or maybe I'm still sour about my first impression of him. Maybe I'm a little jealous of how Doris was more of an aunt to him than she was to me. It's hard to put my finger on what it is about him. The more I think about it, though, the more it feels like it's a me problem. Right now, it's so much easier to think of Gulliver as an extension of my brother Eric, another platonic male presence in my life. Hey, I elbow Gulliver in the back as I pass by. Up for some more dancing under the lights tonight? The speed with which he replies speaks to a mind unhindered by doubt. Hell yeah, but you know what we should do? I don't, but the way he's eyeing the display filled with cookies, muffins, and pastries, I think I have an inkling. Bring a whole bunch of food and be the stars of the party? Gulliver pops some embarrassing finger guns to indicate I'm correct. Just like that, any uncertainty I had about going vanishes. The pieces fit neatly together. I'm going to investigate some magical event, have fun, but above all, I can bring some magic of my own. Not just show up with some good old Miriam-level enchantment, but secure my spot as an absolute superstar at that party. I'm not the kind to bring any fresh tunes, and I'm certainly not going to tear up the clearing floor with my sick moves. In fact, it'll take a non-negligible amount of that mango vodka concoction to loosen me up to even try to dance. But putting aside my complete lack of rhythm, I know what really brings people together. The kids can bring the beats and gyrating hips. I'll supply the fuel. It's tempting to bring some libations of my own, but as I watch Detective Wilson walk through the front door, I'm reminded that I could get in trouble for that sort of thing. We settle for some awesome Nanaimo bars, some samosas, and an assortment of cheeses. All finger food, all loaded with carbs and sugar. Nothing stopping me from dragging a ton of coffee while I'm at it. Especially if I can get Gulliver to do the actual carrying. Oh yeah, these kids are not prepared for what I've got in store for them. Tough to admit it, and maybe it's a sign I'm not the mature business owner I like to picture myself as, but the rest of the day dragged on after Gulliver and I had finished drafting a proper menu. First of all, when was the last time I was invited to anything where I wasn't hired for catering? Sure, I'm doing that anyways, but it's of my own volition, and I have complete creative control over what to make. It's not a gig. It's a chance to feed a bunch of potential new friends and my ego all in one grandiose display. Second, it's a chance to hang out with people my own age. Sort of. I'm sure aside from Gulliver, I'll be the oldest one there, but that didn't bother Pete and Fred. It'll be refreshing to chill with some of my contemporaries for once. Olivia is more than twice my age, and who knows how old Helen Edna is. Gulliver is in his 20s, which is a Rubicon I've yet to cross, so while I've done a good job proving my worth to them and having them see and treat me as an equal, I do miss being able to cut loose with other dumb people my age, to shed the responsibilities of operating the Aquilo and ignore the baggage of being a Dufour witch, even just for one night. 
finally, I get to cook for fun. Not out of boredom, not out of obligation, but out of sheer indulgence. I can experiment and play without worrying that I'll be stuck with inventory or following a specific predetermined menu. Lately, I've been edging ever closer to that point where I repeat dishes too often and prepare meals too far in advance. What happened to the Miriam who loathed warmed-up chili and sandwiches and wanted nothing more than to have every day be a culinary adventure? This is going to be good for me. More than tackling the mystery of the Dancelites, this is what I needed in order to reset myself to factory defaults. All of this. The sun is set and Stefan has taken over his shift hours ago. Since then, I've been slaving in the kitchen, preparing dough and baking delicacies. The cooking area is a mess, but in the name of embracing the spirit of the evening, I've decided to take care of it later. There's an embarrassing amount of parchment paper on the counters, and parts of the floor are sticky with honey while others are slippery with butter. Gulliver is standing in front of the biggest cooler I could find. It's an old thing that looks straight out of the 70s, a huge plastic beast with cup holders molded into the lid and bulky handles that slide out of the sides. And it is packed to the brim. I have a couple thermoses of coffee in my bag, too. My large friend lets out a deep sigh before bending over to pick up the cooler. Biceps I would never have noticed before seem to jump in my face, and despite having seen Gulliver carry large crates and stacks of boxes every week for over a year, I'm suddenly impressed by his display of strength. What the hell's in here? Everything we discussed, plus all the ice packs to keep it all fresh, and the small Coleman stove to warm up a few things, and... But he interrupts my list with his trademark throaty laughter. We're just going to dance and hang out, Miriam, not feed an army. You need to relax. Do you want me to take anything out? I ask, suddenly conscious of how long a walk it is to get to the clearing and the lights. Lighten the load? But he shakes his head. Nah. Besides, it'll be lighter on the way back. We step through the back door so as not to attract attention from the customers, but mostly from my other friends. I don't know why, but I don't feel like explaining myself to Olivia and Helen. This night is for me. Even Gulliver is less of a companion on this journey than an accessory. Like the Nanaimo bars and samosas, he's a treat I'm bringing along. A gift for Pete to gawk at while the others feast on my vittles. I sling my bag over my shoulder, appreciating the biting cold in the air. If it's not yet below freezing, then it's damn close. The walk over is going to be unpleasant, especially once we hit the Pickering's field and we're completely unprotected from the wind, but the dance and the food should be quite enough to warm us up once we're there. My cheeks hurt from the frozen breeze, but also from the stupid grin on my face. Hard to admit how eager I am for this. How happy I am for this. But of course, I can't ever have anything nice without some kind of interruption. Tonight, it comes in the form of a metallic squeak from the dumpster's hinges, followed by the angry hiss of an irritated raccoon. The Don, one of the biggest raccoons that lives in the back of the Aquilo Cafe. He's the undisputed king of trash, the emperor of refuse that dominates his fellow raccoons. We have an uneasy truce, the Don and I. I regularly give him and his family whatever leftovers I have at the end of the day, and they stay the hell out of my kitchen. Sometimes. It's an uneasy truce. But it's not me he's hissing at. The Don doesn't hiss at me. I'm no danger to him in all he surveys. The last time I heard the Don hiss like that, it was because a much greater threat than little old Miriam was afoot. It was when a demon was lurking about. I can feel the scar on my belly, where the hunger demon pierced through me with its claw, grow cold with ache. No more demons, please. In fact, if I could have a break from demons, ghosts, and mythical embodiments of existential concepts for a few months, that would be great. Is that so much to ask? It's not, but as they say, always be careful what you wish for. Oh, Gulliver says, a prelude to an apology. 
I forgot to tell you. I invited Thomas to come with us. Oh, fine. I'll take a demon. What? Why would you do that? It's a stupid question. Why would Gulliver invite someone like Thomas Sinclair to join us at an outdoor dance under mysterious lights? Because Sinclair is a nosy podcaster looking for content for his show? Check. Because Gulliver is too oblivious to get the hint that this isn't an event for people his age, let alone some guy in his 40s? Double check. Because my dumb but good-natured friend has a fan crush on Sinclair? Triple check. I just thought he'd enjoy the lights. I promise not to cause any further problems this time around. Stepping out of the shadows, like sand in buttercream, the man in question walks into the warm light at the back of the cafe. Just the way he's dressed and the plethora of recording equipment strapped onto him, like he's some sort of guerrilla reporter, promises that he will cause nothing but further problems. It's so tempting to call the whole thing off. I can probably put all that food from the cooler in the fridge and use it for the coffee shop instead. And it wouldn't kill me to clean up the kitchen after all. Anything to not have to show up with Thomas freaking Sinclair in tow. That's it, isn't it? He's an annoyance demon. Has to be. The raccoons confirm it. Or maybe the Don just has a sixth sense about obnoxious people. You shouldn't come. I blurt out a final desperate attempt to get rid of him. You'll be bored. Aw, oh, come on, he says, shining a self-deprecating smile. I'm cool. I can be hip. I was showing off moves on the dance floor before you were even born. That's the problem, I want to yell at him. I'm out of date on music and dancing. The only benefit I can think of by having Sinclair with us is that he'd make me look good by contrast. Compared to him, I'll look downright fashionable and cool. Maybe that's what makes me give in. I could put my foot down and tell Gulliver to leave his new best friend behind. I can go on my own. Hell, I can stick to my cowardly plan and just stay home for the night. Avoid the freezing walk. Avoid the awkward conversation. And most of all, not have to explain why some middle-aged conspiracy theorist followed me into the woods. But damn it if I don't thirst for a little bit of acceptance and maybe a sliver of fame. For crying out loud, I've defeated three demons and saved a holiday party from ghosts. I deserve a goddamn parade, but I'm gracious enough that I'll settle for the adoration of my peers because I brought them snacks one night. It'll do for now, and if Thomas Sinclair is there to make a fool of himself, then that's his burden to carry. Fine. I turn to Gulliver, shoving my index finger into his face. But you explain him to Fred and Pete. The walk to the clearing isn't as unpleasant this time. First of all, I don't step in any foot-deep puddles of ice-cold water. The weather is colder and the wind crueler, but I'm also dressed for the temperature. Most of all, my mood keeps me warm, buoyed with the anticipation of a night doing what people my age are supposed to be doing, not poring over ancient cookbooks, not worrying about what next horror might ooze from the cracks of Aquilo's sidewalk, just some good old abandon under the stars, sacrificing my eardrums to the music gods and my stomach to the lords of alcohol and bad decisions. Just the thought of cutting loose hastens my pace. The lights are as beautiful as they'd been the previous night, perhaps even more so. When we get to the Pickering's field, the danza lights are swirling amongst the treetops like drunk fireflies. For a second, I wonder I knew what they could possibly be, but I quashed that spark of curiosity. Abandon is the theme of the night, not curiosity. Click. Oh no. I turn around to face Thomas, his camera still held up to his eye. No, you don't. Something in my face must have told him that I meant business because he drops his expensive instrument to hang by its strap and raises his hands defensively. That was the only one. I swear. He looks sincere, but just in case, I put my hand out to him. Gimme. What? Give me the camera. It's an expensive camera, he stammers. 
and and I swear I won't take give it to me. Sheepishly, Thomas Sinclair, internet personality and darling of the paranormal investigation scene, pulls the strap over his head and hands me his precious camera, careful to put the cap in front of the lens. You can have it back when we leave. I put the camera in the cooler Gulliver has been carrying all this time, gently securing it between two bags of snacks. I won't lie, I considered giving it back. I'm no expert in photography equipment, but I'm pretty sure if I break this thing, it'll put a non-negligible hole in my monthly budget. At the very least, my ambitious holiday present plans would be crippled. Maybe to the point where I'd end up giving macaroni collages to my parents like a four-year-old. The music greets us halfway through the Pickering's field. I feel it through my boots first, traveling up my legs to pound in my chest. After a minute, I can hear the electronic beat tickling at the edge of my hearing. I can't identify the song. I suspect I'll have a hard time naming anything that gets played tonight. That's part of the thrill of this evening, discovering new things, meeting new people. By the time we break through the last line of trees and into the clearing, the music, a slow synthesizer rhythm that's halfway between meditation music and EDM, is loud enough to shake the pine needles of the surrounding evergreens. Two or three dozen teenagers and young adults are dancing in slow, languid movements, swaying with every note, waving their arms in wide, expressive arcs. It's beautiful in its own clumsy way, but it's not the real show. The spectacle that catches the eye and refuses to let go is, of course, the lights. More numerous, brighter, and more alive than last night, they float up into the sky, tickling the moon before dropping down to fly among the dancers. With a little of the initial awe shaved off, it's easier to see that there is indeed nothing mundane about them. Their magical nature is undeniable. No strings attached, and no surfaces on which to reflect spotlights or lasers, each orb is its own entity. They emit no noise like one would expect from a drone, and they're far too controlled to be balloons or toys with LEDs embedded. A couple, blue and turquoise, float right up to me, spinning twice around my head before zooming out towards the heavens again. I let out a girlish giggle so unlike me that I'm surprised it came from my throat. But how can I not? This is the stuff fairy tales are made of. It's the mirror image of all the terrible monsters that have plagued me ever since I set foot in Aquilo. Finally, the flip side to the horror. In a way, I don't just feel glad to be living this unique experience. I feel like I deserve it. You came! I hear Petunia's voice punch through the short break between songs, and it's a delightful thing to hear. Of course, I wouldn't miss it. Oh, she says, putting a hand on the cooler in Gulliver's arms. And you brought snacks. Yes. I'm eager to dilute her drunken flirting, if only to protect Gulliver from further embarrassment. I'm pretty sure I've brought enough for everyone. Where's the best place to set this up? Petunia takes us to the back of the clearing. There's a soft hum underneath the base of the music and the slight smell of exhaust coming from a small generator. A pair of folding tables serve as a hybrid bar-slash-DJ booth where Fred feeds tunes from his phone into a mixer and speakers, while a girl with long, platinum-blonde hair mixes juice and cheap liquor in plastic cups. You know Fred. Petunia points to her friend who nods at me before doubling down on his act, bobbing to the music while holding one earphone to his head. And this is Annabelle. She'll mix you whatever you want. Donations are welcome but not mandatory. The blonde struggles to be heard over the speakers, set up anywhere on the tables. Nanaimo bars, a few leftover croissants, and a large tub of cookies soon crowd the bar with the alcohol, soft drinks, and jugs of juice. I set up my Coleman stove on the side and proceed to start frying up some samosas. It's not the haute cuisine setup I'm used to. It's nothing gourmet and the presentation will suffer, but that's not where the challenge is tonight. I can impress the adults in my life with tomato swans and decorative drops of coolie. These kids? I'll show off just by bringing good food in the most unlikely of places. The same way Annabelle isn't impressing anyone with complex cocktails and surreal mixology talents. Her gift is having booze here at all. 
If anyone's looking for the perfect Manhattan, this isn't the clearing lost in the woods to get it. I should have figured that they'd have electricity somehow and brought a heat lamp. Those samosas are going to be cold before anyone has a chance to bite into them. They'll still be delicious, I'm confident, but there's something about biting into a burning hot, freshly fried samosa, you know? My setup and impromptu cooking is interrupted every minute by the lights. Not because they're doing anything specific. They dance and they twirl, even to the accelerated rhythm of Fred's current song, but they don't interfere with what I'm doing. It's me. I'm the one who allows myself to be distracted by their entrancing beauty. Every dervish-like spin of a rainbow light or the corkscrew ascension they take towards the stars is like choreography performed just for us. It's such a perfect backdrop for dance. These aren't just strobing lights in a club or the spinning flashes of a mirror ball. No laser show can compare to the organic, living movement of lights and pattern. We might as well be sharing the clearing with the fae. Petunia introduces us to everyone. Her friend Jordan, who's clad in black from head to toe. Haley, who spins around like a ballet dancer, wielding the two most useless glow sticks in the world. There's a guy called Eric, like my brother, who actually kind of looks like him too. And so many others. The biggest surprise of the evening is how no one seems to give a damn about Thomas Sinclair. Awkward and out of place, he's a fast food burger at a five-star restaurant. He's a pickle on gelato. But no one seems to pay him any mind. The only person to interact with him is Gulliver, who Thomas has taken to calling Ghost Moose. I make a note to ask about that particular story, but I also take my third plastic cup of vodka mango cocktail, so it's anyone's guess whether I'll remember. An hour into the night, the compliments and thanks start pouring in. Dancers make eye contact and raise a cookie or a Nanaimo bar in a grateful salute. Some get intimately close while dancing, just so they can whisper in my ear how these are the best samosas they've ever had, though most of them simply refer to them as those spicy fried things. Some of them might have been using the adulation as a means to flirt, but I'm both too tipsy to notice and too drunk on the moment to care. Before long, I'm down to my sweatshirt, having shed my heavy coat and gloves. The crush of people and constant movement of the dance is enough to banish the cold. When I look up, the condensation of evaporated sweat forms a cloud that catches the glow of dancing lights, like an otherworldly ceiling above us, crackling and flashing in prismatic hues. Gulliver is particularly popular. Down to his t-shirt, there's very little of his physique left to the imagination. But that's not what really captivates the crowd, though I'm sure Petunia is committing as much of it to memory as she can. It's the energy of his movements and the surprising grace of his footsteps. He's tireless and unstoppable, barely taking a breath and a swig of water before jumping right back in. This is a side of my friend I've never seen before, except for how frequently he laughs his deep-throated laugh, face turned to the heavens as he does so. So. Petunia slides up next to me as I take a moment to breathe. How'd you end up having to bring Uncle Thomas there? She nudges her chin in Sinclair's direction. The podcaster is still navigating the evening with the grace of a beached whale, engaging revelers in conversations they clearly do not want to have. Though, that's not entirely fair either. Some do seem interested, even if only in passing, by his questions. Many of them even laughing at his jokes. He made friends with the snack you requested. Apparently, they come as a package now. Petunia pinches her cup between her ring finger and thumb, swirling the liquid and ice inside. She's looking at Gulliver like I look at artisanal flowers or farm-fresh veggies. Worth it. Again, I get uncomfortable at my friend being objectified, even though I think he'd get a kick out of it. An awkward kick, but still a bomb for the ego. Didn't you say you had a boyfriend? Oh, he doesn't mind if I look at the menu once in a while. He knows I've already ordered. It's funny, because I'm not a nostalgic girl. One of the reasons I became a great cook is my ability to look forward. Mess up a cake? No problem. Learn. Try again. Get better. Dwelling on the past isn't my strong suit. As I watch Annabelle dance and Pete gawk at Gulliver, 
when I listen to Fred's jams and allow myself the abandon necessary to take the floor myself, I find myself missing when Trevor and I used to go out. Not just to the clubs, but dinner with friends and movies at the theater. Don't worry, I'm not pining for my ex. That particular baggage is long unpacked, I hope. It's the socializing that I miss. The people who aren't my parents' age or customers. I leave Pete to her daydreaming and allow myself to slip into maturity for a little while. Bags, plastic containers, and stray napkins litter the ruins of the meal I brought. I pick them up before making the hard decision that I might as well put away my camping stove, too. The oil must have cooled down sufficiently by now, and it'll be one less hassle to endure when it's time to go and I'm tired and irritable. The kids are pretty good with the clearing. They bring garbage bags along with the boxes of drinks, speakers, and folding tables. Annabelle explained how they leave the clearing the same as they found it every night. Apparently, this rule has been in effect for years, long before the current crop of revelers even knew about this place and about the Donsolites. Kneeling next to my cooler, securing my stove inside, I take another look at the lights. Is it me, or are there fewer? I try to locate Petunia so I can ask her around what time the lights stop or disappear. Do they just keep going all night, or does it always take some idiot like Thomas Sinclair to shut down the party? Finally, I spot her, hanging by the side of the clearing. Half a dozen multicolored orbs float around her, circling the girl as she laughs with all her might. She and Fred cast glances at each other. Did I see them share a wink? Fred keeps jamming by the table, a fresh drink handed to him by Annabelle. He puts on another tune and rocks his body to the rhythm. Meanwhile, Pete turns around towards the trees. After a short pause, she walks off and into the dark woods. Her lights follow, swirling into the shadows while they orbit her head. I smile, expecting Fred to follow along, but he's still jamming and bobbing to his song. Instead... It's Thomas who, with a few moments' hesitation, makes his way between the trees. Not a single light is following him as he waddles, weighted down by his notebooks and recording equipment, still holding his own plastic cup. The hell is he doing? I ask, no one in particular. Listen, old man, I tell him in my head. If Pete is going off so her boyfriend can join her later and they can have some alone time, you have no business tailing her. I toss one more cup in the garbage bag next to me and grab my jacket off the table. If this guy has any weird idea, he's about to get an earful from a Dufour witch. Dipping in the woods and between the firs and pines, it's not too hard to figure out where Pete's gone. The lights still follow her, and in the distance, I can see their kaleidoscope glow filter through the branches. Thomas! I call out between my teeth, trying to get his attention without alerting Pete. Thomas! It takes a few minutes of chasing, spotting him silhouetted by the donsolites now and again before I catch up. He's just standing there, like a dunce, staring between the branches of a fir tree. Lights of every color flicker over his face like waves reflecting off the surface of a pool. He's staring towards Pete, mesmerized and unblinking. I don't even bother checking out what has his attention, instead grabbing him by the arm and pulling. Or trying to. Wait, he says, his voice devoid of the normal manic arrogance that usually flows freely. Look. More out of reflex than curiosity, I follow his gaze. And my jaw drops. There are lights. A lot of lights. Far more than followed Pete into the woods. Dozens of lights, ranging from the size of fireflies and up to the diameter of basketballs, float around Pete. They weave between the tree trunks, materializing from the undergrowth to go circle around her. The sheer quantity and brightness makes it difficult to watch, but the curious sight is impossible to look away from. At this point, it's difficult to make Pete out in the glowing crucible. The mix of colors has become a solid block of white, and the intensity gives no sense that it's ever going to stop getting brighter. Until it does. All at once, not unlike last night, All the lights vanish. Again, their absence leaves the senses scrambling to find purchase. Even though they emitted no sound, the disappearance of the lights hits like a deafening silence. 
only to be disturbed by the sound of a lonely plastic cup hitting the forest floor where Petunia had stood. Aquilo is written by J.F. Dubow and narrated and produced by me, Amy Frost. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. Want to support the show? Buy us a coffee. Go to ko-fi.com slash Aquilow to donate. Aquilow has a Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash Aquilow for details. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under the username Aquilow. Aquilow.